We're here today with Father Anthony Cicada um, and part of our continuing series of interviews with Father on various traditionalist topics. Today we're going to talk about the Episcopal consecrations of Archbishop Noting Took, um, which have been controversial in some quarters, um, questioned in some quarters, um, but Father has written quite a bit on this. Um, and obviously works with someone here on a daily basis who derives from that Episcopal line. So he has a interest in, in this. Father, how did you first come to be involved um, in, in even researching um, the, the Took consecrations? And weren't you at one time completely opposed? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, first of all, we had heard about these consecrations uh, being performed. Uh, and we wondered what to make of them. Uh, at that time, I believe we were in the Pius X Society. And we, uh, I ended up researching the history and the different uh, characters involved. But one of the questions in my mind was how did one determine, according to the principles of Catholic sacramental theology and according to the principles of canon law, uh, whether or not an Episcopal consecration was valid, because obviously that's the question, that's the issue. Are these real bishops capable of uh, producing real priests? Uh, for us at that point, it was, a, I suppose, a somewhat theoretical uh, issue, because I believe we were in the uh, Pius X Society at that point. But that was the question. I wasn't able to resolve that initially. After uh, we left the Pius X Society. Naturally, there was the question of what would we do for the future to ensure that we would have a future generation of priests who would work with us and who would take care of our people. Uh, there, was, uh, uh, there were uh, attempts to uh, contact and to interest uh, different uh, older bishops who were retired, working with us. Uh, none of these were really successful. And where did you get these names? Was there a list of, you know, people who were secretly... Bishop with a lot, lots to do, <laughs> with, with a lot of time on his hands. Um, well, uh, bishops that you had heard were somewhat conservative and um, uh, sympathetic to traditional causes. And, uh, you know, you'd think that maybe uh, one of these men would be interested in it. Well, the, uh, that uh, ended up being a, uh, really a dead end because none of them were interested. Then there was the question of uh, Bishop Antonio de Castro Meyer, of course, down in, in um, Campos in Brazil. So Bishop, uh, then Father Sanborn, went down to uh, visit him to see if he could interest uh, de Castro Meyer in helping us out. The general reputation that uh, de Castro Meyer had at that point was someone who was uh, more of a hardline, hardliner on the question of the Pope as, as we were, and we'd hope we might interest him. Well, what year was this? Um, it uh, was after our uh, departure from the Pius X Society, so it would have been uh, possibly 84. But it was before 88. Before yes, it was before 88. Experience. So, uh, Bishop Sanborn had, uh, uh, then Father Sanborn had some very good uh, discussions with uh, de Castro Meyer. He found he was very easy to um, uh, talk with and, and to even argue with over different theological questions. And he had a very good time doing that, was very well received. He asked Bishop de Castro Meyer, well, what, uh, what should we do? We need someone to provide uh, priest for us, and apparently you're not willing to work outside of your diocese. And he told Father Sanborn, go to Gerard, go to Gerard de Laurier, who had been, of course, consecrated bishop by Archbishop Tuck. And de Castro Meyer's um, point to Bishop Sanborn was that uh, obviously this is valid if Gerard de Laurier, who is a um, prominent theologian in some circles, if he got involved, um, you shouldn't have any fear on that count. So uh, Bishop Sanborn brought this word to us uh, back in the United States, and naturally it was somewhat controversial. 
and the, the group of priests that we had, nine, then uh, uh, 12 priests, we debated this uh, back and forth. Didn't any, I mean, some of you had um, Bishop Gerard Delorier as a seminary professor, did yes, you not? Yes, we did. Uh, Bishop Sanborn did, um, Bishop Dolan did, I did. Uh, uh, Father Jenkins did. Uh, some of the other fathers may have had him as a uh, professor. So you were personally as well. acquainted with him, also. Yes, you, you knew who he was, and he was a, 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 a devout and a highly intelligent man. He certainly was a someone who was recognized as a uh, theologian. So uh, he, uh, in terms of, of of someone who had credibility, he certainly had a great deal of credibility, but. Uh, in any event, um, we decided that we would uh, investigate uh, this question of the consecrations that Archbishop Tuck had uh, performed. Now, uh, we had heard that there are no consecration certificates. Uh, there were, uh, we had heard that there were photos of the consecration. We were wondering what was sufficient. Uh, to balance the research and to balance the discussion, uh, two of us um, undertook the uh, question of, of researching the issues here for, for the rest of the priests. Uh, then, then Father Sanborn uh, took the pro, uh, pro took involvement, as it were, uh, the pro validity uh, position. And uh, I took the anti, because I was very much opposed to having anything to do with uh, uh, any of the bishops that he had uh, consecrated. Why is that, Father? Well, it was, uh, I mean, um, a number of them were, uh, well, let's put it this way, real characters. Uh, they, were, they were people that, uh, you know, we would not really have chosen to work with. Some of them, um, the, the Mexican bishop, uh, um, the Mexican uh, bishop, Bishop Carmona, was someone that we didn't really know too much about, I suppose. But, you know, there was a, a, a slight prejudice against him because some of the other people, uh, some of the people that he had consecrated. In any event, um, Bishop Sanborn did his research, I did my research. And what I discovered is that um, there were no particular, no special rules for ascertaining the validity of uh, an Episcopal consecration. And where were you looking, Father? Oh, uh, I worked my way through several libraries. Uh, the uh, Jesuit University Library, uh, Marquette University, uh, St. John's in um, uh, St. John's in New York. Uh, I went to uh, uh, also Fordham University. And whenever I'd get in a city with a Catholic library, I'd go and try to look up material on this. So this I, is way I, back before the internet. Oh, or way back before the internet, when you actually had to look up things on paper, <laughs> which was tremendously inconvenient. In any event, I read my way through an awful lot of uh, canon law treatises and really found that uh, there was nothing in this regard that um, one could look to to say that there were special uh, requirements. Uh, in any event, um, the uh, Bishop Sanborn had also researched the issue, and he had come up with the same thing that I did. There are no special requirements. Um, the uh, other priests in the organization had uh, raised questions, well, what about Took's intention, etc. And uh, Bishop Sanborn found a number of passages that, uh, you know, address that, that, um, uh, you know, one is, is, is a minister of a sacrament who uses a Catholic rite is presumed to have the correct intention. So if you have a Catholic minister and he uh, performs a Catholic rite, he's presumed to have the correct intention. Now, the reason we had to go down all of these routes is because, um, as far as we knew, th um, uh, Monsignor Took had not issued uh, certificates for the Episcopal consecrations that he performed. So uh, we were sort of looking for an alternative to that because obviously you want to be certain. Uh, in any event, uh, at one of the meetings, Bishop Sanborn 
presented some uh, material uh, he had found uh, from uh, Apostolice Curie and Leo XIII about an intention that I found particularly convincing and that sort of pushed me over the edge to regard them as valid. So uh, that's uh, the deep background, as it, uh, as it were, to, the, um, to how I got involved in this particular issue. So you were supposed to play devil's advocate and you ended up being an angel. Yeah, yeah I, well, I, it would depend on who you talk to, of course. <laughs> uh, but uh, I certainly ended up um, being converted on the question. So how did this take with the other, I guess, 11, well, other than Bishop Sanborn, the other 10 priests? Well, I mean... Um, did you have a meeting and pre present? Yeah, some, somewhere, uh, um, as some continued, uh, you know, to be against, uh, at least at that point, said there wasn't enough uh, proof or enough evidence. Um, so there, there was a great deal of, of uh, going back and forth on it. Uh, eventually, after I left the Pius V Society, I had time to uh, research a major article on it, the validity of the Took consecrations, which we... Uh, uh, circulated as a booklet, which we put on uh, the internet. It's on traditionalmass.org. Traditionalmass.org, that's correct. And um, that addressed uh, most of the major objections that uh, had been made uh, to that point. And I uh, cited, uh, you know, chapter and verse from different uh, theologians and canonists and popes to, to deal with the different objections that uh, had been made. And then uh, having gone through um, all of this work and all of this research, uh, because uh, there were apparently no consecrations, uh, no consecration certificates that took it issued, I was talking with um, uh, Bishop Mark Piverunas once, and he said, oh, I have the uh, certificate of consecration that he issued for Bishop Carmona. So the day after Bishop Carmona's um, Episcopal consecration, uh, Took had written out in Latin, in correct Latin, a, a certificate of Episcopal consecration. So from the point of view of, of um, you know, if one wanted a certificate, well, there it was. So this is sort of the high school diploma, sort of. Uh, yes, that's right. And if, if you, you know, question anything else, um, uh, or a celebrette for a priest. Yes, you have it, some kind of paper proof. There's a paper proof for it, you know, even even though there were photos. And the, the priest who had opposed the um, idea of any involvement with uh, bishops who derived their orders from a Archbishop Took, this had been their major objection. Well, there's no certificate. Well, there's a certificate. And then what? Well, uh, uh, then... Um, they found other reasons uh, to uh, say that they wanted nothing to do with um, uh, priests or clergy who derived their orders uh, from Archbishop Tuck. But uh, eventually most of the priests in the uh, group, the 12 who had uh, left the Society of St. Pius X, were won over in the argument. Uh, uh, I believe nine out of uh, 12. Okay. So uh, they eventually came to find the article uh, and the arguments quite convincing. And the rest have, have resisted till present day, I suppose. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, resisted and not recognized, but that's another <laughs> issue. Um, of course, I, I think this is, is somewhat timely. Um, Mario Dirksen um, wrote a very long letter. Um, it's on tookbishops.com, the internet. It's over 100 pages. Um, very, I think, quite well written. But Germans think, tend to be very thorough, you know. Yes, <laughs> Mr. <yes>. Heiner. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is known. Um, so obviously, we don't have time to get into all 100 pages, and I think you've you've touched on a lot of of uh, what Mario much went into much deeper detail to talk about in in his letter. But I suppose what we might um, do is sort of bring us to current day, um, along with Mario's summary, which is we we know via photos, via certificate of consecration, that the consecrations actually did happen. Mm -hmm. um, that we, we know that they're valid, not not only from from us thinking that, well, Bishop Gerard de Laurier is very learned, mm -hmm. he would know, but from looking at 
research yourself, mm-hmm. finding out how a consecration would be valid and, and how it's judged by the mm-hmm. church. Then the question is about, are the consecrations lawful? And obviously this is sort of a gray area given where we are currently in the mm-hmm. state of the church. So can you speak to that a little bit, Father? You know, what, what, when we say that the consecrations are lawful, what does that mean? Well, normally what you would have in church law would be the provision that uh, an Episcopal consecration could, could not be conferred without um, a papal document called an apostolic mandate. So, uh, but that's fairly new in church law. That is, it's 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 fairly new in church law, but it exists. Uh, nevertheless, it existed. Nevertheless, uh, the answer to your question is uh, tied in with uh, tied into the um, question of of uh, how do traditional Catholics uh, justify uh, their sacramental ministry. Um, um, conferring and receiving sacraments without fulfilling all the different prerequisites of, of canon law, of church law. And the uh, general answer to that question is, is those are provisions of uh, church law, but we're in a situation now where the sacraments are needed and the, the priests who do not have the requisite permissions to um, uh, function in different parts of the country to uh, confer different sacraments, um, have the obligation, nevertheless, uh, under divine law and in virtue of their ordination, to go ahead and to confer those sacraments. Uh, that's a, a clear principle in sacramental moral theology, that when the uh, clergy who normally would have the obligation the pastors and the, uh, the diocesan bishops uh, to confer sacraments are not doing it for whatever reason. The clergy who do not have that particular um, uh, assignment in, of, of pastoral care then have the obligation to step in. And so that generally is what traditional priests were doing. And so in the case of um, a a priest who, let us say, does not have permission to perform baptisms, which would be normally required for him when times were uh, normal in the church, he would have the obligation now to confer baptisms on Catholics who maintain the faith. So too for bishops, uh, the uh, because of the question of the validity of the new ordination rites, and the heterodoxy of the modern seminaries, uh, those Catholic bishops who have retained the faith, uh, such as Archbishop Took or Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, had not only the right but had the obligation to uh, pass on the priesthood and the uh, episcopacy to continue the Catholic sacraments. So it's, not, uh, it's, it's a question of, of their obligation. So that's what Lefebvre did, that's what Took did. So knowing that they're lawful, ultimately judging each of the individual consecrations of Archbishop Took was not so much in your scope as the particular circumstances of the bishops you were concerned mm-hmm. with cooperating with. Yes. So you're not necessarily maintaining that Archbishop Took was, was right in all of his Episcopal consecrations or that um, all of those... Do you, do, you, do you buy the idea that if one of Archbishop Took's consecrations were questionable, then they're all questionable? No, it, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in, in, um, uh, doesn't work that way in church law or moral theology. You know, it's, uh, uh, there's the one issue of the consecrations that he performed. Those were valid and uh, those were licit. And um, the other uh, issues are sort of... Um, distractions. Well, the and the thing is that, that, that too, there could always be a, um, uh, there's always the question of, of uh, deception as well. People, uh, you know, certainly can deceive a bishop about uh, their intentions, about uh, who they are, about uh, what they do. And you're not granted uh, that particular, uh, the ability to, to, to sniff that out or to have that kind of uh, insight just because you're a bishop yourself. 
Yeah, I mean, some people, I mean, obviously the Archbishop's not here to defend himself, but some people have been very hard on him that, you know, what kind of man would, you know, uh, consecrate or ordain such people? Um, and so they really lay the blame at the foot of Archbishop Took. You know, he should have investigated. He, mm-hmm. should have, he should have known better. And I think um, it's, it's very helpful to understand that um, Archbishop Took had had uh, murdered uh, family members. Mm-hmm. He's abandoned in the church. Um, he's not necessarily in a frame of mind where uh, he has the resources necessarily to go and do a deep investigation into each candidate. And so, well, l- let me uh, tell you about the the uh, danger of of judging on um, uh, you know not too much information and and uh, judging from afar. The um, well, it's easy to do. Oh, it's uh, easy to do. Sometimes it's even fun. Um, some people make it a hobby. But uh, let me take um, one example. First of all, there's a um, fellow named George Musi. Now, uh, I first ran into George Musi when I went down to uh, help dedicate the SSPX church in uh, Dickinson, Texas. And the superior of the church, then Father Hector Boldick, said, "Let's go over and um, let's go over and eat at this place uh, just across the expressway. It's called Hofbra House. It's really great." So we went over uh, to eat there, and uh, it was uh, very German, very gemütlich, and they had an umpa band and, and so on. So the owner came over, or the manager came over, and um, he asked if we were Catholic priests. And we said, yes, we were were Catholic priests. He said, well, so am I. And he introduced himself as George Musi. Uh, And he was the priest of uh, some diocese in in, uh, Texas, but he was not functioning as a priest. Uh, And I didn't quite get the entire story as to why not. Well, several years later, um, I learned that uh, George Musi, or Father Musi, had been... um, he began to function again as a priest, I think with Father, Father Bolduc for a while in, uh, uh, in Dickinson. And eventually he became uh, what would be called the state of a contest, and he was consecrated a bishop by Bishop Carmona down in Mexico. And of course this struck me as perfectly crazy. The guy is running and, uh, you know, has, has left the priesthood. He is uh, running in a... Um, a, a, a pretty good restaurant with an umpa band, but that normally that's not uh, something that would be required by canon law for <laughs> uh, Episcopal consecration. And here he shows up and he's a bishop. And so you think, well, this, all this is nuts, and you think that Carmona was nuts for consecrating him. Well, then you learn so the. So you didn't think about opening a restaurant? Uh, <laughs> no, and I love German food. Um, <laughs> so uh, I thought this was perfectly crazy, but when you. Uh, then the question is, there's the other side of the story, which I didn't realize at the time, that um, how Musi ended up as a bishop was that uh, Bishop Carmona had a seminary. Uh, he had founded a seminary. He had been a seminary professor himself. And actually, it turned out, was a, a fairly widely respected priest in, in the Diocese of Acapulco, where he came from. But uh, a transiat, uh, he would take care of these traditionalist groups, very militant traditionalist groups in different parts of Mexico, uh, where the uh, traditionalists had taken, would take over churches. And, um, Cristero style. Uh, Cristero yeah. style, and they would, um, uh, you know, battle the local modernist and, and bring in priests who said the traditional mass. Well, Carmona went up to one of these places in the mountains to do confirmation, and he's coming down, And he was kidnapped. He's a bishop. Uh, He was kidnapped by banditos who had been hired by the Novus Ordo priest to kidnap him and um, uh, uh, to hold him unless the ransom was paid to kill him. So it was after, uh, eventually Carmona talked himself out of that, but it was after that that he decided that I've got to find someone to consecrate a bishop because these people are going to kill me. 
So uh, he, uh, because Musi lived in the United States and was a state of a contest and was uh, essentially just kind of on the other side of the border, he figured that this would be, uh, you know, good for him to do. So what happens is um, sometimes you don't get the whole story and it changes your perspective and it certainly changed my perspective about that. Before I thought it was nuts, but then if you're uh, kidnapped and threatened with death, you've got a seminary and everything, uh, you're going to want to make some provision for it. And now you know the rest of the story. As they would say, yes, as Paul Harvey would say. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, I never knew that uh, that whole German restaurant thing. I'm actually kind of hungry now uh, hearing it. Yeah, well, it's Friday, so. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's when meat tastes best, actually. <laughs> um, so, you're, you're, I think your point is well taken here, Father, that it's very easy to look and say, well, that person was, you know, a notorious um, evildoer, and Archbishop Took should have seen that. Mm -hmm. But we weren't there. We weren't in the room. We weren't there uh, to be told by this man who was seeking Episcopal mm -hmm. consecration, whoever whoever they may have been. And I I think one of the, the great untold stories, and I, I think maybe perhaps it should remain untold because it's not the most exciting thing to hear about, is Archbishop Lefebvre, too, uh, ordained uh, some men um, who, in ordinary times, um, one, some might argue, would probably not have been ordained. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, in the heady early days of traditionalism, um, there were, there were uh, measures taken that, that don't, you could say don't have to be taken now as there are hundreds of priests um, not only from the Society of St. Pius X but in other other places um, who are saying exclusively a traditional mass. A traditional yes. The, it's a um, different world now. Uh, indeed it is. Uh, another thing about information when it comes to uh, Tuck is um, uh, you know he was um, portrayed as uh, basically as a crazy old geezer and who didn't know who he was, uh, what he was doing, et cetera, as, as like an automaton operating on autopilot or something like that. Well, the, the fact that after the initial consecrations, he wrote out a certificate in Latin is, should disprove that in the mind of any reasonable man. But in terms of additional information that uh, one eventually got about Tuck, uh, there are uh, many, many interesting things, and you run into people who actually heard Tuck and who knew him after he performed those consecrations. Um, we, uh, there are some priests that we work with in Mexico who, are, who were present at a conference that Tuck gave, um, and that was uh, uh, translated from French into Spanish, in, uh, in Mexico. And uh, these, these uh, uh, priests were very, very impressed with him. There's another uh, priest we came into contact with, Father Francis Miller, who uh, was, uh, who actually lived with Tuck uh, in Rochester, New York, for about a year and a half. Uh, Tuck had been brought over to the United States by um, uh, the then Father Louis Vizelis. And what time period would this have been? Uh, I'm not entirely sure on those dates. I've, uh, if, would this have been the 80s? Uh, in the 80s, some, at some point in the 80s. So uh, maybe 83 to 84. So Took uh, actually lived uh, with these people and uh, uh, this Father Miller was then a student uh, living with um, uh, then Father Vizelis uh, in Rochester, and he talks about, you know, talk how he uh, functioned normally, etc., uh, joked, uh, uh, was a quiet and kind of a humble man, uh, you know, said, uh, you know, he had nice conversations with him, said Mass in a very devout way, um, and gives a completely different picture from the the popular prejudice of someone who's an automaton who didn't know who he was or what he was doing. That's obviously that's absurd, and that's something now we know from uh, from credible people who knew him. So well, you but that, that caricature serves some people's narratives. Oh, of course it does. Yeah, it's much more useful to think that yeah, way. But uh, uh, yes, and uh, you know, don't confuse me with the facts. But I mean, these are all uh, reasonable, credible people that. Uh, uh, that you deal with. So, in the point of view of, of uh, trying to maintain that he was 
um, crazy or didn't know who. Uh, that's a pure prejudice and runs against really against the reality uh, of it. You know, as 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 uh, we learn by speaking with these different people. Mm. So, we've talked about the fact that the consecrations took place, that they were valid, that in the in the broader context. And Father, would you would you say it characterized that divine law? Supersedes canon law in times that in times like this in the church. Yeah, there's a is whole. That a, is that a there's a phrasing? whole. Um, there's an understanding of, of a hierarchy of laws, and the whole purpose of ecclesiastical law is to uh, support and to promote the divine law. Uh, the salvation of souls is the whole purpose of ecclesiastical law, and if there's a provision, uh, if an individual provision of ecclesiastical law uh, is applied in such a way that it doesn't serve that purpose, or in fact it, it directly impedes that purpose, then it ceases to apply. It ceases to bind. And that's a, a general principle in a church law that has to do with intrinsic cessation of law. That's the 25 cent term, with inflation I suppose now the $10 term. Uh, for it, but uh, because it, it harms something, harms the salvation of souls, uh, it ceases to apply. So, how are Catholics uh, now that those who've had a chance to see this, they're a bit more informed? Um, there are some groups. I, I think of one in particular. It's really just confined to the United States. It's not really known internationally. But um, some groups just continue to avoid anybody having anything to do with. Um, took line consecrations as, you know, filled with the plague. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose how how are we as Catholics um, supposed to deal with these facts now that we've been presented with them, and how how can we deal with um, Catholics who don't don't want to be confused with the facts? Uh, there's an element of uh, donatism uh, to it that uh, um, uh, somehow. The uh, people in that, that particular frame of reference think that uh, you're going to get um, uh, sacramentally infected somehow. And it really doesn't work that way. The, the sacraments, their validity is independent of the moral qualities of the minister. And the sacrament is, is, is valid if you have correct matter, form, and intention. And the uh, moral qualities of the minister really don't make any uh, difference. So this is this is uh, a, a type really of donatism. Uh, the and it's 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 really something that uh, has to be rejected, you know, from from that point of view. That uh, the uh, or a type of guilt by association. Yeah, and it's it's bad theology, and it's based on bad theology as well because of the, uh, you know, how simple really the prerequisites are. For considering a sacrament to be valid, if you have a Catholic minister who performs a um, uh, confers a sacrament using a Catholic rite, it's uh, automatically presumed to be valid. Um, some will try to construct, uh, let's say, their own uh, principles to say that you have to have someone who um, witnesses uh, that the correct matter and form were. Uh, applied and before has you to be can a qualified see qualified witness. He, he has to be qualified, yes, uh, be able to answer questions about that. But that's an absurdity. And having read myself uh, through several um, uh, sacramental theology sections, several libraries, it's an absurdity. No one says that. My question uh, to anyone who's, who claims that is, where is it written down? Give me a citation, please. I want to look it up myself. And of course, they never can. They never can. I know you're big on footnotes, Father, and that's not not a bad thing. For <laughs> those of our, our viewers who don't know what Donatism is, could you just kind of give a quick footnote? It was a her heresy that uh, essentially maintained that the the uh, uh, if if you had a heretical minister, that his sacrament, the sacraments that he conferred, were invalid. And that those who had received baptism, let us say, from a heretical minister, had to be rebaptized. So somehow that their loss in holiness had removed their um, sacramental character. Precisely, or, or removed their ability to confer, even more than that, to confer a sacrament validly. But if that were the case, you would never know whether or not uh, a sacrament you were receiving is valid. It would make no sense. 
uh, the the whole sacramental economy would have to go would be an uh, open to question would have to go out the window. Uh, so too, um, it would all go out the window if you had to have qualified witnesses to every sacrament, because um, we're doing a, a um, baptism this coming Saturday or this coming Sunday, and so um, you know would one have to have a, a two people present who could attest to the fact that Father Larrabee correctly pronounced the form Ego Te Baptizo Nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. However, then uh, the question is, what about the hearing of the two witnesses? That would have to be tested as well. well it, so it's, it's sort of a rabbit hole, and then when you get to the water, heaven help us, because you'd have to have chemists, but then you'd have to be sure that the uh, knowledge of the chemists was qualified and that those in turn who had tested them for their qualifications in chemistry to determine whether you had hydrogen and water, whether or not that was uh, uh, that was the case. Well, so it's, a, sure it's the, the rabbit hole. working for the Freemasons. Uh, also, precisely. I mean, this, is, this is a further issue. Well, and, and Mr. Dirksen <laughs> makes the point I, much more viscerally for me that um, I certainly don't want to meet qualified witnesses in the confessional. It's certainly me. not. <laughs> <laughs> so, I uh, hadn't thought of that one, but that's a, that's a pretty good one. If that, but if see that, that he's a German, so he's covering Stephen. He's covering all those bases. <laughs> we must we must be very complete. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, so, and I, I think. Um, in sort of summary, Father, if, if it may have been predicted early on that as time goes on, more and more people will doubt the two consecrations, I think actually the reverse has been true. And I think Mr. Dirksen makes this point as well in his, in his letter that over time, frankly, it's been completely the opposite. As the facts, as you point out, as the facts have come out and we've had more personal testimony to, to clamp onto the actual look it up facts, um, more and more people accept it. Sure. Yeah. Um, just as uh, um, um, valid and true. Yes. Thanks so much for your time today, Father. Thank you very much.